How are you guys? How was spring break? Uh, it was short. It's way too short, I agree. So this starts uh, three weeks of guest lectures now. And uh, first guest lecture for you guys is uh, Miguel Martin and Haley Dilbeck. Um, they're both agents for Transamerica now. And um, they were students of mine not too long ago. So uh, it's a nice story about transitioning from, uh, from graduation into to the work world and, uh, and being entrepreneurial while doing that. So that's, that's my intro for you guys. Uh, you got the stage, take it away. If you want to stand right around here, then the, the video will pick you up. Oh. All right, guys. Well, my name is Miguel Martin. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Woods for bringing this in. And actually, if it wasn't for Dr. Woods, um, I actually wouldn't be working with this company, <coughs> believe it or not. Um, yeah, sure. I'm Haley Dick, um, and I'm an associate at Transamerica. And yeah, if it wasn't for Mr. Woods here, uh, I wouldn't have the job at Transamerica either. Um, so we're going to go ahead and share a little bit of our stories, and then we're going to transition to Transamerica since most of your questions were about the firm we work for. So we're going to try as hard as we can to keep you guys past you guys' time limit in here. Um, can't make any promises, though, so you guys will probably get out a little early. Uh, but first off, how many of you guys have heard of Transamerica before? Show of hands. One, two, three. Okay, cool. All right, well, <clears throat> what we're going to do first is then we'll just show you a quick little video about our founder, uh, a little bit about the story of Transamerica. Then we'll go ahead and jump on into any questions you guys might have. Don't play it quite yet. It'll take a second for okay. the screen to warm up. Okay. So I remember like uh, a year ago before I graduated, I was in your guys' shoes. And I remember being so like scared because I didn't have a job yet, didn't have the degree yet. And uh, Mr. Woods' class actually initially um, opened me up to how hard it was to actually get a job. Um, but luckily for you guys, you guys have the help of you know me, Miguel, Mr. Woods, with any questions you guys have, if you need help like making a resume, anything like that, we'd be more than happy to help you. Um, I know I had tons of help. I redid my resume about 50 times with you and other professors. So I'm gonna leave my phone number if you guys need anything at all in the next you know, month when you're looking for a job. You can go ahead and text questions to me and things like that. But by show of hands, how many of you guys are graduating this semester now? I guess I got more juniors than I thought. Okay, you know, he said it was all seniors, it's okay. Um, no, that's fine, but how many of you guys already know what you're going to be doing once you graduate? Okay, cool. But, okay, so actually I was in the same position as the rest of you guys that didn't, that didn't raise your guys' hand. So I was actually sitting in the same seats, and I was already, uh, let's see, it was fall quarter, and I was like, man, I don't know what the heck I'm going to do. I was going to school for management uh, and finance. I wasn't really looking too hard, but you know there wasn't too much of an open door for finance around here. Uh, and then luckily one day, Jay Thompson sitting back here sent an email blast to Professor Woods, and he sent it out all to all his students. And I opened it and I read it. I was like, okay, well you know, uh, it's a cool seminar. It's you know they're not going to charge. Uh, there's going to be some career options. Can't hurt to go. You know I haven't been looking too hard. So I took a trip out there. You know, and, and what I seen just blew my mind, right? So before that, I was actually working with my dad uh, while I was going to school. So my dad actually owns a manure spreading company, so he works out in the ag business and you know, ag agriculture industry. So he's been doing that for about 16 years now. And so I've been helping him ever since I was little, but I hated it. You know, it's cliches and myself, it's a pretty crappy job, right? <laughs> working with all the manure, I was like, this is not for me. And he's like, okay, that's fine, you know, but if you want to get ahead, you gotta own your own business. So ever since he told me that, I was like, yeah, I wanna own my own business, but in what? You know, I was thinking, I was like, mm, option, and, you know. So I went out to go see what Transamerica had to offer. And what they had to offer was just perfectly what I was trying to do. You know, I kinda like teaching a little bit, but I don't wanna be a teacher. Um, and I loved finance. Finance was a lot of fun. Uh, my professor who taught it had a lot of passion, rubbed off on me. So. I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. You know, so the career options within Transamerica is just, you know, unbelievable. Um, but besides, let's uh, get into this part real quick so you guys can take a look at what Transamerica is actually all about. Imagine yourself in San Francisco in 1906. 
entrepreneurs, many of which have capitalized on gold rush fortunes, are transforming this city into the Paris of the West, a hub of elegance and commerce. For you, April 17th is just like any other day. You turn in early and are sleeping soundly when suddenly everything changes. Early in the morning, you're thrown to the floor as the ground shakes violently beneath you. What you'll soon discover is that your city has just experienced one of the largest earthquakes ever to strike the United States. You and your spouse survived, but with little more than a few personal belongings. Amid the chaos, you're about a man who's offering help. A.P. Giannini, a young banker with a reputation for helping small merchants and immigrant farmers, is lending money from a makeshift desk on a dock in North Beach. Instead of collateral, he requests only a handshake. The generous banker doesn't make a big deal about what he did, but you hear about him in the years to come. Like when he provides funding at a critical time for the emerging California agricultural and wine industries, or purchases bonds to secure construction of the Golden Gate Bridge during the Great Depression, or when he loans Walt Disney the money to complete his first full-length animated film. He later forms the Transamerica Corporation as a holding company for its rapidly growing financial enterprise. By 1946, he has created the largest private bank in the world. Yet you remember AP as a personable man who was there to help you and others when they needed it most. 100 years later, Transamerica still serves that same role. Serving the needs of others is the only legitimate business today. Transamerica is actually a lot more than just insurance. They also take care of investments, right? You guys know of anybody who wants to make millions of dollars tax-free before they retire? So you guys can enjoy through retirement, right? So we show people ways to do that and get that done. We go everything from you know, state planning to debt reduction, the whole nine yards, okay? So uh, by the way, if I sound nervous, it's because I am not really good at doing presentations. I hated these in class. Um, but, so the floor is open. We'll start with asking any of you guys if you guys have questions. If not, we'll kind of just read down the list. If you guys have any specific questions, so who wants to go first? Okay, we can just go ahead and read the questions then from the list. Okay, so... Jacqueline Taylor asked, how do you market your business and how are people aware of your business? Um, most of our business is kind of done word, word of mouth. You know, we'll, I've met with friends and family members and I'll show them what I'm doing with my accounts and how I'm generating revenue and making more money with the money I already have. And um, I'll show them the accounts we have on the phone and they'll meet with me in about like two minutes we'll set them up and they'll typically tell someone that they know. And it's, it's pretty easy that way. And then of course marketing through networking events and things like that help as well. So I'll just drop, jump down to uh, Dorian's question about how important is networking to your line of business? It's kind of the lifeblood of our business. We stop talking to people, kind of stop working. So that's the whole thing on that one. Um, let's jump to the next one. Why the insurance business by Erica, okay, why the insurance business? Actually, that seemed to be the, the most boringest you know, profession to me in school. I actually didn't even know I was gonna get into that. Just kind of seeing the investments and all that kind of stuff. It actually rubs off on you. It's a little fun talking about you know going into the insurance policies and going into investments and all that stuff. But it's more than just you know teaching. You can actually change somebody's life. You know, have you guys, you know, when you cru cruise down the street or whatever, and you see signs for car washes because somebody's loved one passed away, they have to raise money like that. Now how hard do you think it is for them to raise five, six, seven thousand dollars doing that? Right? When they can just pay, you know, who knows, ten, fifteen, twenty bucks a month and if they pass away get a half a million dollars, you know, in in uh, in money for their family to to help them. So why the insurance business? <laughs> yeah. That's an important it, little part. Yeah. Especially if you're not 
especially in Bakersfield, because you'll see um, a lot of couples and the woman doesn't work, right? If the man passes away, what happens to her and the kids? They have to move back in with grandma, they have to start finding extra work other places. So life insurance is pretty important. I didn't think that when I was in college. I was just wanting getting on the investment side and deal with the stock market and all the fun stuff. But life insurance is an important part of what we do. What are the biggest opportunities in your line of work? And Randall Smith asked that. Um, the biggest opportunities. I would say the biggest opportunity is actually Transamerica itself. Um, when I was in your guys' shoes uh, before I started looking for financial crazy, like the, uh, it sounded like a job, first off. But secondly, it sounded like they weren't geared towards the customers at all. And that scared the crap out of me because I was like, no, I went five years through hell in college, I want to do something that's helping people now. And um, so after meeting Jay and talking to Transamer about Transamerica, it's not a job, it's a full-time your own business kind of thing. And it's not like, how many of you guys have heard of Northwestern Mutual? Everyone, right? Because they've all tried to recruit you. Um, it's different than Northwestern Mutual. They don't own your book of business. You get to keep your family and your friends, and you get to own your licensing. Um, so Transamerica opened up the to working with people I want to work with and not uh, and being taught right, you know, actually being taught how to help people. So the opportunity itself is actually the best part. So what I understand is that the small business management class, right? How many of you guys are actually going into or want to manage your own business or run your own business at some point in your life? Two, three, four, okay, that's good, right? So the opportunity itself is just great because it's not a job. Right, you work for yourself, so you get to manage everything without having to take care of payroll. Right, you don't have to spend nights and days just going over payroll, having to do that. We have a home office of 400 people out in Georgia that take care of all of that. Right, so it makes managing your business a lot easier. Right, so you can worry more about helping families, um, kind of building your own office and managing people to help create, you know the best way that you can to go out and help the most people. So the opportunity itself is just the biggest thing. So it gives you a chance to take away from all the, the little grunt work of doing payroll taxes and all that kind of stuff. All you have to worry about is the people and the clients themselves and running your own business. So there's a lot of great uh, things that run off from this class into the business that we're actually in as well. All right, I got a good one. Um, let's see. Um, or B, uh, Rosalando asked, Alfredo asked, how was the transfer from CSUB to the work industry? And do you wish you had attended graduate school? That's a really good question. Um, the transfer from school to here was, it was difficult for me um, because I worked a full-time job as I was doing this and I kind of broke off a few months ago um, when I quit that job. But at first it was very difficult to find a job, but luckily from the help of professors and other people, that made that a little bit easier, but it took me three months after graduating to find a job, and then it took me about six months to transition over to having my own business with Transamerica. I would say mindset. Mindset was the biggest thing for me. Um, shifting over from this, you know, working with my dad is just kind of, you know, do this, do that. You need to do this. He would show me how to do it. Same thing, I held an internship out with another company. It was miserable to me, right, because I was locked up in a shack. Not a shack, it was kind of a big building, but it was in the production area. It just, it wasn't for me. But I would say the biggest, you know, to transfer over from going to school to running my own business was the mindset. I had a mindset of being told what to do, you know, there's gonna be, I didn't have to worry about much because I just show up to work and then here's what I had to do, get that done, go home and do whatever. So switching over to this and being my own business owner is like, what do I need to do? I need to sit down, plan my days or my weeks ahead and just get to it. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but I wouldn't trade it for anything. There's a lot of self-improvement so as far as going to graduate school, I kind of feel like I'm already going to graduate school. You know, I intend to come back for my master's, just not any time in the next couple of years. Right, there's a lot of self-development going on, teaching myself how to be a better business owner, better person, teaching myself those kinds of things. I do pick up a lot of textbooks or you know, um, books to read and grow myself. But uh, I feel like that's already going to graduate school, right? So in the next couple of years, I do plan to come back, but 
that's kind of what the transition's like going from school to workplace or becoming your own business owner. It's a little more chaotic than just going to work for someone or yeah. you know, going to a regular job or doing something like that. And Lafredo, if you are um, thinking about going to graduate school, I would just make sure to have experience too because I know a lot of people with their um, their master's degrees and they are working at you know, doors still because they haven't had a job. So make sure you have a job too. And then this is another good one. What are Transamerica's biggest competitors? Um, the good thing about Transamerica is we are under the company Aegon, and if you don't know what Aegon is, they manage the NFL's pension fund and NASCAR's pension fund, which opens up a lot of doors for us as a company because we don't utilize just Transamerica products. We have almost everyone else's products too. Like most uh, financial firms use Max Mutual, and um, we have that plus everything else. Yeah, so Aegon might not be a familiar name in here because they're a Dutch company. They're about $500 billion in assets. All right, so they do, uh, in 1999, they actually purchased Transamerica, or I forgot how many billions, um, but they purchased everything that Transamerica owned. Right, so all of you guys have taken an Uber, right? You guys know who Uber is and stuff like that. Well, Uber doesn't actually own any of the cars that they, they service you, right? So we're not, you know, we work with Transamerica, but if Transamerica is not necessarily the best fit for the client that we're talking to, we work with companies like Nationwide, Jackson, Fidelity, Vanguard, we work with all the top companies, you know, and yeah, that's their competitors, but at the same time, that's also who, who we work with, so we have access, you know, to help the clients, so we don't necessarily deal with just Transamerica if it's not the best fit for the client, right, so. Okay, and Jimmy asked, what does Transamerica do for you? We value people the most, at least on, um, under Jay Thompson. The clients are the most important aspect um, of what we do. So let's see. Emma asked, what do you guys enjoy most about your jobs? So for mine, it also might be the most difficult thing for me. Because um, as you guys can tell, I'm a pretty shy person. I hate it speaking in front of people. But the best thing or the thing that I enjoy the most is meeting new people every single day, right? Going out, genuinely getting to know people, getting out of my comfort zone, pushing me out there, you know, that's that's the worst and the best thing, though. To stretch myself out of the comfort zone, so not trying to be so shy anymore, coming out, meeting every individual person, you know, try to change their lives or just get to know them a little better. So, I mean, I get to make a ton of new friends, right? Whether they want to become clients or partners or whatever, I get to meet a lot more friends and meet new people. What I wasn't, you know, used to doing back in in school when I was going to school, so that's you know, the best part of the job for me. Yeah, that's a good question. I love money, so the best, <laughs> yeah. My favorite part is getting to see uh, people's um, assets and where they're putting it. What's crazy to me is when I meet like a 40-year-old that doesn't have a plan yet, and I'm like, oh, that's, that's sad, but like it's exciting for me because I get to help them plan it out. And then we get to dream about their beach houses and they'll obviously take me with them. So. Not that part. And this question, this is a good question. Um, Lillian asks, your company supports a lot of philanthropic, how do you say that word? Philanthropic. Thank you. Philanthropic uh, causes. Um, which do you value most and why? Um, we do support a lot of different organizations. Um, I recently have come across a, a really good company um, called Dress for Success, and they take women who have um, got, just gotten out of jail and are on the rougher end of things, and they help them, uh, they take them in and they help them find a, uh, like three wardrobes to wear, and then they help them figure out how to talk to an individual when giving an interview, they help them get that um, uh, first job. So it's really nice being able to hear their stories and seeing the transitions that go with them. Um, another question here by Fahad is, is the insurance business fast paced and or fulfilling? So it can be fulfilling if you're fast paced, right? So but like I said, the thing here was, you know, you, you work for yourself, right? So if you're not pushing every day, you're not going out meeting new people, 
might not be fulfilling because you're not gonna be making any money or helping any people. All right, so that comes into work ethic and stuff like that. But yes, it can be very fast paced. It's very competitive. And that's what makes it really fun. You know, you go in there, you talk to somebody who sits down and they show you what they have. I'm like, oh, okay, that's good, you know. Um, most often times, our products, you know, since we work with so many, you have access to, okay, look, this is how we can help you do this and do that. But it is very fast paced. But at the same time, you can get left behind if you're not going out and, and uh, meeting new people, helping them with their financial situations and things like that. Do you guys have any other questions on that we're talking to things having to relate to your small business? Do you guys have any other questions? How many of you are planning to start a business after school? Like right away? Are they you? You guys all want to work a little bit first? Yeah. Very cool. That's one thing I like about working at Transamerica, it's very flexible. So I have the you know the opportunity to go out and do other work on side projects too. They pay us each um, each item we uh, sell clients. Um, we do you do have an initial um, fee to pay to become part of the uh, company. They found that if um, they didn't charge for it at all, everyone would just sign up and then they would just drop off the cliff afterwards instead of staying with the process. So, so I mean, if you think about it, if you guys wanted to start a business, what would you guys have to go do? I go get a credit line, right? Get two, three, four hundred thousand dollars to uh, borrow, right? Then you go out, you start your business, and then you got to take care of all the other back offices, right? So the associate membership agreement here that turns on, you know, not only a website to get your customized, you know, website to handle for people, but you also get a backing of a five hundred billion dollar company at your side, right? Not only do you not have to take care of, you know. Uh, payroll and all that other stuff, but you can just focus on the good stuff, right? People who want to work, just come in and you start working right away, right? There are some licenses that you do have to take because it is all um, legit, right? You have to go through the state, sometimes through the federal, you know, you know, the government and all that kind of stuff to get your licensing and fingerprinting, all that kind of stuff. But when you come in, you can just go ahead and go straight to work. You don't have to worry about, oh man, you know, do I have to pay so and so or this and that? You just come in right away, you start working. So there's a lot of benefits. Um, <coughs> rather than you know just starting paying back a credit line doing all that kind of stuff so the investment the initial investment is pretty low compared to what you're thinking about doing or if you have any other plans to go into any other business or things like that. Yeah. This one says what is something you would recommend to a new client who is interested on starting coverage with Transamerica uh, to better be prepared for emergencies and why are he um, first off, we wouldn't recommend anything to a client without speaking to them first. Everyone needs different things. They have different wants and desires, and to get them there, each product is so different. Um, the reason I would choose Transamerica over any other company is the same reason that I work for them. We have such a huge spread um, of products to help you with compared to other different financial firms. So, yeah. Yeah, so another question here by Rasheed. I'm sorry if I said that wrong, but... Uh, which aspect of your studies do you feel prepared you most uh, for this job? So coming into this job, right, you know, most like anything else, when you go to any other job, you don't know a whole lot. Right, so I was going to school for finance, you know, uh, management, knew a little about, you know, what they teach you in the book, but I came here, you know, when I started to come here, we do trainings and all that kind of stuff. Instantly, it was like, man, you know, I went to four years of school for finance and I learned more in a day here than I did in four years over there. You know, so a lot of it's self-improvement. But when you come into the business, they take care of you. You know, you do product trainings, you do you know trainings for concepts and all that other good stuff too. Um, so, which aspect of your studies do you feel prepared? You, me, I'm more technical, so I like to read anything word to word, just to make sure I already know it all. And sometimes that's not always the best approach, but I feel like that's the approach that applied to me coming straight from school to this type of area. You know, it's just learn everything word for word, or not word for word, but you know, go into details about. I'm definitely not technical. I like to do and then trip and fall and then eventually stand up and now I know what I'm doing. Um, but in school, they, um, the thing that helped me the most was uh, speaking in classes and talking to professors more so than just um, the normal lecture of the finance classes and stuff. 
it helped a lot learning the math and everything, but I think what helped the most is just learning from their stories and their past. Because you learn, you learn so much more when you're at college in the workforce. You just do when you're doing it. Having, you know, having worked with my dad or working with my dad, my mom's usually the one that takes care of all the payroll and all that kind of stuff with small business management. She also went to school for that. Um, man, it's a pain in the butt. You know, I've helped her. I just walked in, I'm like, what the heck are you doing? Right? She has to take care of So I've seen how all the payroll taxes and all the other corporate tax, all that kind of stuff is just like, there's no way. I don't want to have to deal with any of that going into business for myself or anything like that. But, you know, that's what you have to look forward to, right? When you're doing your own business, you got to take care of every single little thing. Okay, so um, as this business relates to small business management, you know, you get to just manage, work on yourself, right? You get to manage where you want to spend your time. So a lot of it's time management, um, but also personal development and being good, a good communicator. That's what it comes down to. Um, other than that, that's all the questions. I think we pretty much covered all of them. Did we miss anybody's questions? Did anybody else have any other questions? There's one more. What was a difficult situation that you faced and how did you overcome it? I'd say for us in the industry, the most difficult thing is the people itself. It's, um, it's the most fun having to sit down, getting to sit down with people, but it's also challenging because people are like, uh, I don't feel like I want to do that today. I'll get back to you, let me think about it. And I'm like, this is right here. We've compared every single other product. Are you sure you don't want to do it right now? People are kind of their own worst enemies in a way. So. You just overcome that by helping them see the light at the end of the tunnel. You won't get here, you won't get to that beach house. Unless you make a retirement plan, like, unless you want to work until you're 90. So. Do you guys have any other questions? You guys are all juniors right now. Do you remember being a junior? Yeah, it's probably not as certain to you guys right now. But you're seniors though, yeah. right? <laughs> Uh, definitely, you know, we'll leave our number by, but if there's any kind of curiosity here to you guys, you know, if you guys learn of anything, if you guys want to learn anything more, you know, how it relates to small business, business management and all that kind of stuff, we'll leave our numbers here where you guys can get a hold of uh, Dr. Woods. Um, you guys want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, get to know each other a little bit more, however. I'll, uh, I'll throw a couple other questions in there. Okay. Um, is it possible to start a small business while having another job? Yes. Absolutely. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, it is possible. Like I said, I was at a car dealership and I worked there six months after college. And then I started with Transamerica on the side doing my studying and getting the uh, licensing that I needed to switch over. Um, I imagine that actually starting your own small business too would be the same. Uh, you just have to put the time in. I mean, you guys are all crazy right now. You're in college. Um, how many of you are working at the same time you're in college? Yeah. yeah you guys could start a small business. Yeah. It's um, it's challenging, but it's just like school. So, diversification. Is anybody familiar with that word? And are having multiple streams of income? Right. You could be working one job, but most often times with jobs, there's a cap. Right, so if sometimes you're sitting at the cap, you know what you're making for the year. So how are you going to spring a little extra for a new car, or for a new vacation, and things like that? A lot of the, a lot of leaders in our business came in part time. Right, that's what's so unique about our actual business. You know, if you go and um, talk with other companies and stuff like that, they'll want you to go full time right away. You got to focus on that. Leave everything else you have. So what's pretty unique about our business is that we let you kind of get your, your your foot in the door. Right, you get to check it out. Um, as you're going to work, there's always time. A lot of people, if you treat it like a hobby, it's not going to work for you, right? But you got to come in, be focused and determined, have extra income, and then finally, when you're able to replace that income, you know, the opportunities that the business can provide, you know, with multiple, you know, multiple ways of income, um, residual income, your own personal production, all that kind of stuff is definitely possible to do so. And, you know, a lot of people are doing it. People who drive Uber, they most... Most oftentimes have another job that they're doing too, right? But it's that extra income that keeps people coming in so they can either save it or spend it and go do something fun with it, right? So that's that's a big part of the new thing coming up now. A lot of people want to start their their side business, their side hustle, whatever. Right. 
What's the first step to becoming a financial advisor after college? Hmm. Being serious about it, right? Because there's a lot that goes into it. You gotta, you gotta put in some. You gotta. There's an investment to everything, right? You gotta take a couple licenses to make sure you kind of know what you're talking about, right? You don't want to go in there and be like, hey, you know, put everything right here, and then you don't know what you're doing, right? So you, you got, you know, there's a couple, you know, there's a couple exams that you have to take. Um, it's a good investment that you have to do too. But then all after that is just on the field ex uh, experience. Right? You go out there, you go out there with the trainer and they show you what to do and how to do it. After that, it's easy. It's really easy to do so. So there's not a whole lot of lot to it other than making up your mind and knowing you know, that's, what I, okay, that's what I wanna do. Do you have to have a brokerage firm sponsor you in order to get your licenses? That's important to know. So you can't just go out and take the uh, series exam, the exams that we have under our belt, you have to have a brokerage firm sponsor you. That's how you become a financial advisor. What's the biggest objection you get from individuals to start a financial plan and how do you overcome it? <laughs> well, I think for us, it's a lot of it is doing with building trust, rapport, talking with people. Because um, if you sit down with an older couple, all of us were young. What the heck do you know? Even if you do know more, I feel like I've ran across this Quite a bit, I'm still running across it. I could sit there and talk to somebody and know more than they do in that particular field, but because I'm younger than them or maybe I haven't built enough rapport, they're like, yeah, okay, cool, uh-huh. So I give them all this information, I leave, and then they go with someone else. All right, so it could do with, with being younger. Uh, it could be with not building enough trust or things like that, but those are some of the things that I've noticed have been you know, a little bit of my difficulties to deal with, so. because they're so excited because they can see it in the future. But they, they're almost scared to be successful. Um, and that's like the biggest challenge when I sit down with a client and I make out a plan for them. And the second biggest is getting them to follow it. You can't make them if they don't want to. What personal skills have made you successful in your career? a lot of mine are still developing. You know, I'm learning out on the job, falling on my face a lot, I'm learning from that. That hurts, but you, know, you get used to it. But I, I say I'm still developing, right? So I could, I don't have a clear answer to that yet. Um, getting my uh, I would say learning how to talk to people and communicate was the biggest thing for me. Um, it was very hard for me, say, like my sophomore and junior year of college, having fluent conversations with people and getting them to feel comfortable and you know, talk back with me. I was very shy, awkward, and nervous. So I didn't really like talking to people that much, but kind of branching out from that has helped me the most because I get to meet people now. And now I'm going to networking um, events and just like start random conversations with people and end up making clients out of that. That's the biggest thing. What does a typical day in the office look like? Or not in the office, but what does a typical, what does a typical day in your job look like? <coughs> phone calls, yeah. <coughs> There's a lot of different ways, you know. Uh, a lot of it you, is a, a warm market, right? So when you sit down with somebody, say, hey, you know, who do you know that we, you know, could potentially go and show this? So if you're not getting referrals, you're not going out and talk to people. So basically, that's it. Going out, talking to people. You know, if I'm at the car wash, I'll pull a couple cards from the from the deck and say, hey, look, I ran across your card. You know, you keep your options open, or you want, you know, things like that. But just going out and talking to a lot of people. That's what it looks like, you know, hardly in the office, all that much. Yeah. For me, it's networking opportunities, which is nice. Um, typically, during the week, I'll go to a couple different networking events. Like, um, there's groups called Boss Ladies, um, obviously the Chamber of Commerce events, and just talking to people and meeting them that way and then sitting down with them after and having lunch. That's, that's what it looks like. It's a lot of champagne. Uh, what's the most rewarding part of your job? Besides the money, seeing the <laughs> smile on a person's face, like, man, I just, you know, I could just, I potentially change this person's life if they stick to the plan I would put together, right? That's, that's what's really rewarding. You sit down with them, you know, they kind of spill out, oh, this is what's wrong. Okay, look, here's how, these are different ways that we can potentially help you. And just seeing the smile on some of the people's faces, just like, okay, stick to it, and that smile is going to stay there, right? Because 
And then they're on their way to achieving all their other dreams and goals. A lot of people, when you sit down with them, they don't <clears throat> think about, you know, a lot of times I say, top five, pl top five places you want to go and visit. They'll be like, I don't know, the beach? I mean, you always go to the beach, right? He asked me, it's this place, this place, this place. It's get people, getting people to dream a little bit more. Um, that's what's, what's pretty rewarding, too. And then they go through the plan, and they're able to do a lot of that stuff if they stick to it. No question. Um, based on your experience or what you've seen, how many people have actually followed your a financial plan that you guys are Do people actually do that? A percent, yeah, a lot of people are happy to. You know, it's if you follow, it's a, a lot of it's on the follow up, right? So if you stay through it and you talk to them, okay, um, you know, they give you a certain amount, okay, this is what I want to do, okay, great. You know, and then some people, if they're serious, you call them back the next day or two. And that's how you know if they're serious or not, right? You go through, you put in some work, and then if they don't answer your phone calls the next day, you know, but I would say a percentage, a good 70, 75% people, yeah. A lot of it, like I said, some of it's because I'm younger too, so I, I'm not saying that's really like, Actually, once like you actually spoke to them, and let's say they do agree, and mm -hmm. you set this financial plan, that's, they're happy and they're gonna go with it, but you know people change their mind along the way in life, right. many times. Right. So it's like, that's how I was trying to like ask it. Do people actually like follow along well, yeah, the whole so way? So another thing is that, you know, part of how we, we earn our keep, is you gotta meet with them every year or every, you know, twice a year. Someone just say, hey look, is everything still, you know, are you still going in the direction you want to? Because a lot of it's course correction. You know, if you set a plan and stick to it, you know, a lot of people's plans, they change every single day. And so you gotta keep meeting and adjust the plan, adjust the plan and work the plan, right? That's one of the things that our, a guest speaker of ours said back when I was in Dr. Woods, the plan is you make a plan, follow your plan, and then adjust your plan. Do you ever wake up and not want to go to work? <laughs> no. Not anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, not anymore. Well, I was working in the dealership. <clears throat> yeah. I hated it with my dad. <laughs> Waking up like at four or five, I'm like, I don't want to do this no more. <laughs> but yeah, no, coming here, it's a lot of fun. I love what I do. I love what I, you know, show people, teaching them all these concepts and stuff like that. It's fun. I love it. I remember during uh, my senior year of college, I worked uh, 70 hours a week as a waitress. And then I did school, and then I uh, worked at a, on the weekends at a wedding facility. And I remember like waking up after two hours of sleep and going to the next job and being like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> but not anymore. Not anymore. What's the best advice you can give someone who wants to start their own business? Talk to us. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I would say know what you want to start in, right? Know what you want to do. A lot of people, including myself, is like, what do I want to do? Right, then I took a little chance and went to presentation that our company holds. Fell in love with it. It's exactly what I want to do. Um, but I would say have a desire, a burning desire, right? And then follow it. That, that's, what I would, you know, that's what I would suggest. Because if, if you know, you know, if you know what you want to do, figuring out how to do it will follow. And if you want to start a business, we have our mentor, Transamerica, just happens to be one of the SBDC um, right. mentors. Right. And he knows everything there is about small business. Yeah. His name's Jay Thompson, he's sitting right back there. Um, if you do actually want to start a business, I would honestly come to one of our meetings <coughs> because he's incredible. Yeah. He's helped multiple companies get at the top of their industry. Yeah. Uh, all the small businesses and all the businesses that he works, he's getting awards every single year for helping these businesses go from here to here. Right, so if you're just throwing out ideas right now, catch them on the napkin. So you don't know which one you might want to stick with. Yeah. And the worst thing you want to do is forget about it. Because you know, who knows what that could potentially do for you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. In that case, first of all, let's give a big round of applause for <laughs> I need questions from you for the rest of the guest speakers. I sent out an email the weekend before um, the weekend before uh, spring break started, and a lot of you haven't written up questions yet. So, for all the rest of the guest speakers that we're going to have Wednesday next week, the week after, I need you to go into that email that I sent and write up questions for the guest speakers. That's a required part of your course grade. No. Do we no, have them in before, like, like, end of this week, or, like, for Wednesday, or do we have to have them, like, before each time they show up? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be, like, would it do, like, all of them were due? Uh, 
over through grave or just like you? Yes. I'm confused on that word. Both. <laughs> I'm going to send emails to the rest of the guest speakers tomorrow, um, and I'm going to give them a link to the questions. So when I give them a link to the questions, and there's no questions there, it looks kind of bad. Yeah. Um, but technically, I can tell them, you know, there'll be more questions before you, you know, check again before your, your talk. So the most important thing is that we have the questions before they, they speak. Yeah. But the sooner, the sooner you give me the answers, the better. I don't really or so, the sooner you give me the questions, the better. Okay? Cool. That's it. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Thanks, man. Good to see you again. No, you did well. You did well. Yes? Yeah, I guess one.